personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library podcast. I'm here today with Sam Jacobs, and we're going to talk about the Battle of Athens. And it has nothing to do with the 300 or anything in Greece, um, or for that matter, Athens, Georgia. This is in Athens, Tennessee. Um, and, you know, I like, as, as regular listeners may or may not know, um, I am a big fan of things that to me are important from American history that no one knows about. So like one of the first articles I ever wrote when I started working for ammo.com was about, um, the, uh, black civil rights movement organizing NRA gun clubs in the 1950s. And I think this is like kind of, you know, on that level in terms of both its importance and how kind of hidden it is in history. Um, I, I'm not a conspiracist. Like, I don't think that this is that there's some, you know, shadowy forces working behind the scenes to keep you from knowing the truth about the Battle of Athens. I basically just think that, you know, public schools are incompetent, but. Let's talk about the Battle of Athens. I mean, I think that one thing I want to start out by saying is that people have this view of the Jim Crow era South as being a place where only blacks were disenfranchised. And I think that I don't want to try and make some kind of equivalence between poor white Southerners being disenfranchised and black southerners being disenfranchised because i don't i don't think that they're equivalent and i just want to say that from from the get-go i mean there's differences of scale i don't think that there's something you know more morally reprehensible about denying somebody the right to vote based on race than it is because they're poor um but i do think that the scale of the disin i mean like basically you know many southern poor southern whites were able to vote uh, in the post reconstruction era, virtually no blacks were allowed to vote. Um, and I think that that, that dis- that distinction is important and I kind of want to lead with it. So people don't, you know, get confused about what it is that I'm, I'm saying here. Um, but the battle of Athens is, you know, this was a battle. It wasn't like guys were fighting each other with, you know, blackjacks and brass knuckles and stuff. It's like they were shooting at each other. Um, so it goes beyond even things like, you know, that a lot of people don't know that there was basically a, a civil war in Minneapolis in the thirties that lasted, I don't know, weeks anyway. Um, but mostly is just confined to like street fighting between cops and, and teamsters. Um, this is like, they're shooting at each other. And they're doing assassinations and attempted assassinations. I mean, it's really wild. It's like you can't, you kind of can't believe that it happened in the United States. But uh, it lasted two full days, two very intense days, I would imagine, for the people who were involved in 1946. And the roots go all the way back to the 1930s. Um, I think that, you know, again, I don't want to kind of overplay my hand on this, but I think that, that even calling this like whites uh, fighting Jim Crow is not really accurate. I think that this was kind of a pan racial resistance, a multiracial resistance against, um, anti-democratic forms of government throughout the United States of which this is the most famous and probably the most important so let's get into it. Um, basically, there was a, a corrupt political machine that was centered in Memphis, but had a lot of influence throughout the entire state of Texas. 
Um, as you may know, machine politics are, you know, not limited to the Democratic Party, but are overwhelmingly the province of the Democratic Party. It's where they draw a lot of their strength. Even to this day in national elections is like, you know, it's a get out the vote operation. Uh, vote early and often means something different in Chicago than it does everywhere else in the country. Um, and that's kind of, you know, that's been their their bread and butter for, you know, a long time for the Democrat, at least 150 years uh, has been controlling uh, the polling booths, particularly in large cities and handpicking the right candidates and using their overwhelming numbers um, to win elections that they maybe aren't winning fair and square. So, you know, to kind of like put into context how deep this influence extends in this specific case, you know, they would change election laws, they would change city city charters, county charters uh, to make the election process more favorable to E.H. E. Crump's uh, cronies. This is not terribly different from, again, what they do today. The mail-in ballot thing this year is a really good example of like, well, we're going to change the rules of who's allowed to vote and how, how people vote. And that's going to be, you know, we're going to use that to be the difference maker in the election. So you're still kind of winning the election by votes, but you know, who counts the votes and who's allowed to vote and how people vote. These things make a significant impact on the final election results. Sheriffs and sheriff's deputies in the Crump machine controlled areas were generally paid on a fee system. That means the more people they lock up, the more money they get. So what do you think that they're doing? And by the way, when they, uh, abolish police in your city, this is basically what they're going to go back to. Cause it's going to, you know, you'll, you'll get, a uh, you'll, you'll be able to call the social worker during a home invasion and the rich people will be able to call private security contractors who make more money, the more people they lock up. So look forward to that when that comes to your town. Travelers and tourists were generally targeted. So there was, you know, there's multiple examples of entire buses being pulled over, like literal, literal, you know, a Greyhound bus gets pulled over and the sheriffs get on and ticket everybody on the bus for drunkenness. Um, and it's like, well, I'm not drunk officer. Well, you sure look like it to me. Here's your ticket. And there's not really a heck of a lot you can do about it. I mean, there wouldn't be a heck of a lot you could do about it today, but certainly social media and a camera in everybody's hand makes this more difficult to pull off now than it would in, you know, the thirties and the forties. So why Athens? Well, Athens is in a place called McMinn County. This is, um, a historically Republican County within Tennessee. Um, Tennessee, I think for a variety of historically complicated reasons, mostly due to the low, percentage of slave owners and the high percentage of freeholders in the state was all, always had pockets of, of um, Republican support, despite being a part of the so-called uh, solid South, you know, they still had a lot of pockets of, uh, I mean, you know, Andrew Johnson, the um, Lincoln's second vice president and the 17th president of the United States, he was from Tennessee and kind of, um, represented that trend of thought in Tennessee that wasn't quite, you know, aggressively anti-slavery, but certainly was anti-secession and, you know, wary of the power of large plantation owners, wary of the role of slave labor with regard to the wages of free labor, resistant to and resentful of being drafted into things like slave patrols for the purpose of hunting down some, you know, rich plantation owners, quote unquote, property. Um, so, you know, Tennessee went for Democrats, I think, for every election between 19 or 18, whenever they were admitted back to the union until probably Goldwater. Um, 
I don't have the the maps in front of me, but you know that seems about right to me. Uh, but there were, have always been Republican strongholds within Tennessee, and basically the the theory of why the Crump machine had so much power, particularly at this specific period of time, is that they were able to deliver this area to uh, President FDR in the 1936 election. And the Justice Department was investigating electoral fraud there in 1940, 1942, and 1944, but didn't take action. I don't know, maybe they were too busy sticking Japanese people in concentration camps or something, but they, they didn't do anything about it. Um, the poll tax, which is now, it was weird because this came up in the, um, in the uh, Amy uh, Coney Barrett hearings about... Are, are you against a poll tax? And it's like, Booker, it's like there's a constitutional amendment prohibiting it. I don't think we're going to have the poll tax coming back. Um, but at that time, they did have poll taxes. Um, politicized ballot counting was another way. And, of course, you know, the old Democratic Party chestnut of having your dead cat vote. Um, a lot of dead people voting in McMinn County. I mean, they probably, you know, if they were alive, they probably would have voted for Democrats anyway. <laughs> um, so World War II made things worse because most of the young men in the county were off fighting the war. And that meant that they really had to scrape the bottom of the barrel to get sheriffs and sheriff's deputies. Like all the best men are either in Europe, in the Pacific uh, you know, there's, I don't know how many people were like using the farm exemption during that time, presumably enough to keep feeding the country. Um, uh, but you know, who's left is going to be, uh, old men and some farmers, maybe some ministers and a whole lot of people who are either disqualified from service or doing their damnedest to, uh, duck out on service. So that's who they were hired, hiring to enforce the law. Um, that included a lot of ex cons. So, you know, that's not good. Um, gambling and bootlegging were generally permitted for the politically connected, which, you know, once the law enforcement begins kind of working hand in glove with, um, Organized crime, that's never a terribly good thing. Any of you that are from the Northeast probably know quite a bit about that. And making things worse, you know, the machine basically controlled the newspapers and the schools and all the best jobs in the county. So there's not a lot of escape from the Crump machine in the area. You kind of got to play, at least play ball with them. Because they can take your job, um, you know, they can make your kids' life hell in school. They run all the newspapers, so it's constant propaganda. So it's not a good situation. And I think that, like, it's a good example of how, you know, a place that would have been a quote-unquote white area would have been um, manipulated and dominated by Jim Crow Democrats to the detriment of the whites who live there. And again, it's my point is not like that white people who were being oppressed or however we wish to term it by the system have it as bad as, as blacks did. Um, they certainly didn't. So again, I'm going to keep making that point throughout because people tend to get confused when you say things like this. Uh, Sam, I'm curious about something. Was FDR very personally involved with the Crump machine, or was it something he more turned a blind eye to beneath his I would, su I would suspect it's that he turned a blind eye. I'm not aware of any evidence that he was involved in in it, and I'm sure that like it kind of would have been way below his his pay grade. You know, like I just don't see FDR, particularly by his third term when he's like, his health is starting to fall apart, that he's going to pay a heck of a lot of attention. I mean, the history of the Democratic Party, particularly from 
reconstruction through to, you know, when Goldwater kind of starts breaking, breaking up the solid South is that uh, the leaders are all, you know, good at running a machine or good at being bag men for machines. And I think that in Crump's case, he's kind of more in the bag man category because it's such a low level, you know, piddling kind of thing. But that was what they, you know, what you were expected to do as a Democratic Party official during this time period is to just deliver votes to the National Democratic Party. So that's, you know, I, 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 I doubt very much that he was involved in any significant or meaningful way. I mean, you know, a handshake here and there and, and you know, giving the, uh, the relevant kickbacks would more have been kind of what, you know, he would have done. And I doubt he would have even been that involved in that because that would have been like, you know, the Congress, the Congress critter from that area and the Tennessee senator and things like that. Okay. Would have been. So the gallant new leader may have had no knowledge of this whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that like in the in the broader strokes, he knew that this type of thing went on, whether he knew specifically that it was happening in in McMinn County and the details of how it operated you know, I think was like, a, I don't want to know how the sausage gets made kind of thing. But like FDR certainly knew that, like, that's how the Democratic Party operated. I mean, I don't know if, um, I don't know if LBJ was in the LBJ was in the Congress at that point. Um, I'm looking it up right now. Yeah. So LBJ would have been in the Congress at that point, And LBJ is was like that was how he became LBJ. Like he was he was really good at that aspect of um, Democratic Party politics, controlling the machine. I mean, he ran like LBJ ran his machine like it was the Navy. He knew how to keep it running. Um, and I think FDR probably did too, but FDR was a lot more high level. And at this point, LBJ is very much in the like trenches. So, uh, how this all kicked off was there were two servicemen who were on leave in McMinn County who were shot by allies of the Crump machine. Um, County servicemen received news of the, of this while they were abroad and they were itching for a fight when they got back. They just couldn't wait to get back and settle the score. I mean, imagine like these guys are like 18 to 30 years old and they're all kind of full of piss and vinegar anyway because they're in the middle of a war zone and they hear that one of their guys gets shot. Two of their guys get shot back home. I don't know what, what the like why they why they were shot, but one of the servicemen interviewed during the Battle of Athens said he was way more concerned about what was happening in McMinn County that was happening overseas. I think that, that sentiment was probably not uncommon, you know, because it's like McMinn County, not a big area. And so it's, you know, think about like your hometown and the connections you have to that. It's like, so GIs from, McMinn County get demobilized and come home and they are, they like they're, they want to fight, you know, they're just waiting for their kind of, they're waiting for the other side to make a move so they can do something. And one of the things that's going on is because there's all these, you know, basically goons because the like sheriff's department is basically a goon squad um, they start, you know, rolling these guys for their muster pay when they come home, which is, you know, not probably the wisest decision on their part. So their first attempt to retake it is that they're gonna, um, they're just going to win the election. 10% of the county's electorate is returning GIs reform candidates, uh, ran on a nonpartisan slate and the goals were just reform within the county, 
the expulsion of the Crump machine for good. This is also a like trope of the Republican Party during this time period is that when they win, they tend to win on like broad anti-corruption stuff, especially in cities. It's like people eventually get tired of all the graft and like having to, you know, kick kick back everything and like you know i have a friend who owned a bookstore in chicago in the 70s and like the cops showed up and were just like all right you need to have our envelope you know every week or the or you know sure would sure would be a shame if your place got burgled and the cops didn't show up so make sure you got the envelope huh. and see it's yeah, man, I mean, like I used to go to a pizza. the community does that I used to go to a, a pizza place in Boston that I'm not going to name, but if anybody's been there, they'll know exactly what place I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, they sold these sli- slices of pizza that were like the size of a quarter section of pizza for like a dollar. And that's why I worked in Boston. I was broke and I would eat there every day. That was my lunch. And, and it was like 50 cents for a thing of, you know, RC Cola or whatever. And, nobody ever left with a box except Boston cops. Ah. Boston cops were the only one walking out with pizza boxes ever. Like I had literally never saw anybody buy a whole pizza there, but cops were always walking out with boxes. And it's like, what do you think was in that box? It wasn't a pizza. Um, this is very, very common in, you know, big Northeastern cities. And Chicago basically is a Northeastern city, you know, in the mid, in the Midwest. So eventually people get tired of this type of thing and they, you know, kind of send in Republicans to clean house and, you know, and then, Oh, well, you know, my cousin Joey doesn't get his no show job anymore. So I'm going to vote the Democrats back in. And this is like kind of the cycle of urban uh, politics during this time period. So one of the, this is like one of my favorite parts about, one of the big impetuses for this little mini revolution was the enforcement of laws against public drunkenness because these guys who were from this area, and we've talked about this in the past, like, you know, the guys in McMinn County were not like translators and code breakers and uh, fly boys. They were grunts. These were good old boys without a lot of education. And that meant that you were going to be a grunt. So, they were used to being able to just like drink themselves to unconsciousness whenever they, the spirit moved them without being pestered by authorities. And so once the goon squads started shaking these guys down at, you know, their local honky tonk, they were, they weren't going to stand for it. So, The opposition slate was called the GI Nonpartisan League. The Democratic areas had Democratic candidates, Reform Democrats, and the Republican areas had Republican candidates. This is similar to the strategy pursued by the Populist Party in the immediate period following Reconstruction is, you know, you would run Republican candidates as populists in black areas, you would run Democratic candidates as populists in white areas. Um, This is kind of a tried and true strategy for winning elections. Uh, It was truly based on nothing. You know, the the basis of the um, movement wasn't partisan. It was patriotic and uh, anti-corruption and democratic and, you know, the best possible way Uh, Local businessmen made large donations, presumably because they were tired of giving large kickbacks to the machine, which I didn't read anything about them doing specifically. But I would be very, very surprised if uh, local businessmen were not expected to make large donations to this uh, machine and, you know, give like make work jobs and no show jobs to um, somebody's nephew and cousin and everything else that kind of goes along with this corrupt kind of system. I mean, I grew up in a city that was like basically run by the mob. So I have a very clear picture of how this kind of thing runs. Uh, The people were worried about their votes getting counted, probably with good reason. And so the slogan of the GI nonpartisan league was your vote will be counted as cast. The tensions rose because the thugs from the machines just started attacking 
these returning GIs because it was pretty clear that like if you were returning from the war, you were probably in this political movement. Um, I mean, this is like also a thing that happened. We talk about this in the Robert F. Williams podcast and article. Uh, this is just like the guys who were coming back from World War II were not going to take any shit anymore whether they were black people who were being disenfranchised or white people who were being disenfranchised is just like, these guys were not going to put up with any more shit when they got home. So they started a self-defense wing of the league. Um, that was 30 men. It was mostly from poor men who had like frontline combat experience. I mean, guys who were like, who would have been like, you know, bayoneting Japanese soldiers, in the Pacific were these guys, they, these were hard men is the point that I'm trying to make. So Crump hired 200 deputies, a lot of them from out of County. Some of them were out of state. They got paid 50 bucks a day, which is like $650 today. There were generally 15 patrolmen used in any election day for the entire district, but this time they hired 200 guys. So they're getting ready to steal it. I mean, it's, it's very clear that like, that's what they're doing. And that's when things kind of come to a head. So at 3 PM in the afternoon on August 1st, a patrolman named CM wise, who was uh, nicknamed was Cindy attempted to prevent an elderly black farmer named Tom Gillespie from casting his vote. Um, Presumably with the assumption that no one was going to care if he stopped a black man from voting, which, boy, was that a miscalculation. Uh, Gillespie objected and the poll watcher objected. Uh, Gillespie had some racial slurs hurled at him and then got punched in the face with a set of brass knuckles. He dropped his ballot and ran away and Cindy Wise shot him in the back. And that was the thing that kicked off. The Battle of Athens. Wise, by the way, is the only man who was ever prosecuted for what happened at the Battle of Athens. He got uh, one to three years in prison. I have no idea what he served off the top of my head. So the GIs all gathered at a local store they'd been using for their headquarters. They contacted the governor and the attorney general of the state and requested backup for ensuring a legal election. But the, of course, they did nothing because um, the Crump machine was deeply embedded in Tennessee state politics. And they learned that the Crumps were Crump forces were dispatching armed guards to all the polling stations throughout McMinn County. So then they were just like, okay, well, we're going to get some guns because clearly this is what it's coming to. And they broke into the local national guard armory and looted all the weapons. The sheriff showed up at the polling station where Gillespie was shot and ordered it closed. And, in air quotes, arrested two GI poll watchers. They were taking hostages. So the GIs responded by taking seven of the deputies hostages, tying them up, taking them out in the woods and, you know, beating the piss out of them. All the polling stations were closed. Ballots were taken to the local jail and the GIs decide, okay, well, all the ballots are in the jail. We need to get the ballots which means we need to take the jail and we need to do it before, you know, the state government sends in reinforcements for the other side. So here's where the, here's where it gets really, I mean, I, don't, I think the whole thing is fascinating, but here's where it gets really interesting. Um, you know what, you know what guys who've just gotten back from a war zone know that a bunch of layabouts and criminals who sat the war out at home shaking down drunks for their pay don't they know small squad operation tactics and strategies so like i mean i've talked about this in other podcasts like you can go to the range and shoot your ar-15 all the live long day but if you don't know how to work with seven other guys in a in a in a, a shit hits the fan scenario um you might as well use the AR on yourself because one guy with a rifle, unless you're, you know, a heavily trained combat Marine is not going to make much of a difference when, uh, seven guys who, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten guys who know not only how to shoot a rifle, but how to work together as a unit show up. And that's what these guys are basically, you know, there's a bunch of like kind of the dregs of society Versus a bunch of guys who just spent the last four years killing everything that moves 
uh, with eight of their best friends in the most dangerous areas of the world. So it's not really surprising that the GIs win, you know, spoiler alert, the GIs win or else we probably wouldn't be doing this as a podcast, but, um, they take, they just utterly lay siege to the, um, they utterly lay siege to the prison. The standing order is if you, if you leave without a weapon, you're allowed to go. But if you come out with a weapon, you're going to get clapped. So one of the escapees gets out and tries to call in reinforcements from an allied boss in the next county over. They don't want to send anybody. The GIs are chucking dynamite at the prison. That's more of a psychological impact thing because the, they hit cars and the cars blow up and, you know, it looks like a cool shot from an action movie because the car is blowing up and spinning around in the air. Uh, but they do eventually breach the roof of the jail using dynamite and the deputies inside surrender and give up the ballot boxes. So the, the battles are over by three 30 in the morning. Two days is maybe an exaggeration. This is like, I think something like 12 hours. There are some minor acts of retribution, but mostly people are very jubilant and celebratory. You know, it's they're, they won. And so they're all happy and they're in good moods and they're ready to kind of let bygones be bygones. Uh, 400 people in the courtroom elect an ad hoc committee to preserve law and order in the area. The head of this is, is a Methodist minister and the secretary of the county election commission indicated that he would certify the election in favor of the GI slate. The new sheriff elect was put into protective custody in Sweetwater, Tennessee in jail. Uh, they got news that the crump machine was going to assassinate him. So they spirited him away to somewhere safe and, you know, they won, they won big, um, deputies and, they uh, got paid a salary rather than how many guys they picked up. County salaries were capped at five thousand. Um, they the fee basis was phased out over four years, but it, the writing was on the wall. Um, there were gambling houses that used to fund the Crump machine and their allies in the area. Those all got raided and you know broken down. I mean, this is one of these things that's like what you know. Like, why is gambling illegal? Well, that's one reason why. They moved to the other parts of the state. Uh, it was really kind of spreading like wildfire. Uh, the governor, Jim McCord, directed the Young Democrat Clubs to recruit ex-GIs for membership as, to, uh, as an, uh, an attempt to counteract this. And there, there was a movement to start a new political party, which actually had quite a bit of steam until... General Evans Carlson, who was a uh, general from the United States Marine Corps, urged veterans to not form their own political party and to work within the existing two-party system. And that is the sad ending to the story. You know, they, they, there was a lot, there's a lot going on here. So the, the, a lot of GIs felt like they got rid of one machine and just stuck another one up in its place. It was a common concern during the, immediate post-war period that returning GIs were just going to come home and, you know, act like armies do. Uh, people were very, very afraid of that, that there was going to be violence against the American government from GIs, which, you know, things like um, the Fry Corps in Germany and the Mussolini's March on Rome. This is very, this is recent history for people. So it's not the most unfounded Fear and the Battle of Athens didn't do a lot to, you know, I, I, I don't think that I think most Americans hearing about this probably would have been quite concerned about the events. Like, oh, man, like a bunch of GIs just spent 12 hours shooting at government officials in uh, in McMinn County, Tennessee. And so, you know, Tennessee basically went back to business as usual. The, there was no uh, GI party created. Um, which I think is a damn shame, not because I have any, you know, particular animosity towards the two party system. Um, I am proudly a registered Republican and will be for the rest of my life and don't even bother to, you know, fill in, uh, the bubble 
for every candidate. I just hit vote straight Republican ticket, and I could care less what any of them believe. Well, you have uh, said before that ideally, or perhaps somewhat ideally, only veterans would be able to vote. Yeah, and I, I do believe that. You know, I do think that, like, I think that Paul Verhoeven is really bad at making satire because he makes, you know, militarized societies and robotic cops look awesome. But yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, that, that, you know, being a warm body who's lived 18 years on planet Earth is not um, significant or sufficient, rather, qualification to vote. Um, I doubt, I don't know that the GI party or whatever it would have be called would have, you know, changed the laws to that effect. But I think having a political party, which was led by veterans would probably have put America into a much better position than, you know, our, our country is run by lawyers. Is, um, is the battle of Athens kind of a lightning in the bottle situation? I mean, you know, you had all these capable men who had just been sharpening their teeth on exactly the kind of combat that was needed to undo the crump machine. <clears throat> and they all came from a tight knit community where they knew one another. I mean, that feels like two, two rarities nowadays. Yeah. I don't think it's like, I don't think it's, you know, I don't know to what degree it was a replicable, uh, event during that time period even. So I think you're right. I certainly don't think that it's like, you know, a thing that could happen again in our time and place, or even that, you know, if it did, that it would necessarily be good. Um, I think that like the main sort of organizational model that comes out of this is the, you know, the, the law and order committee. I think that, you know, there's places in the, in the United States where law and order has broken down and that um, some kind of, you know, committee to restore order, provided that it had, you know, the right base of support, could go a long way. Uh, I think that the parallels with today, you know, I mean, a lot like the rioters frequently get freed by district attorneys who are funded by George Soros and don't want to enforce law and order because the rioters target, you know, small businesses and average working people and things like that. I basically, you know, my analysis of these of the riots isn't that they're like that this is some far left thing, even though the people in it certainly probably p profess far left views. It's that, you know, these people are are basically like Wall Street's foot soldiers, whether they're aware of it or not. Um, and then that's, this explains, you know, that I mean, you'll notice that again, as I mentioned before, you'll notice that they're not like camped out in the financial district of New York, like they were 10 years ago. What an amazing coincidence that all of our, uh, that all of our political radicalism in America has been directed away from corporations and banks and the very, very rich towards, you know, a guy who owns a sporting goods store uh, and, you know, kind of average workaday whites. Um, what an amazing and fortuitous coincidence for the wealthy elites of this country. So, you know, I think that like kind of erecting parallel um, institutions of power is maybe the, the takeaway from this. But I also think that the, one of the things that you hit upon that's very, very important is like, you know, so what can you do? Well, don't go out and start a vigilante committee, boss, because like that ain't going to end well for you. What can you do? Uh, make friends is <laughs> really like, you know, people don't exist in these tight knit communities anymore. And I think that um, the best thing that you can do for yourself, your family, your community, uh, your state and your country is to without kind of, you know, forcing it and making it something ridiculous and setting up some, you know, group or whatever. I don't think people should join any kind of group, but I think that the main thing people can do now is just kind of, you know, get involved in their communities by making friends and doing things together. And, uh, there are a number of 
low level positions, both in municipal and county government and within the two political parties, though I certainly would prefer that you join Team Red, uh, that are just there for the taking because nobody wants them. And the people who do are elderly and are dying off. So like, you know, how hard would it be for you to become county clerk where you live or get elected to your school board or, you know, whatever else. And once you've got that, it's not even necessarily about the levers of power that you have access to. It's about, uh, which aren't, you know, insignificant because I think that in some ways, the county clerk has a lot more power. I mean, there's a whole like William Burroughs thing about how we want people were like, why don't you run for president? And he's like, I'd rather be commissioner of the sewers because like I can, you know, shake people down for <laughs> their you know, cut of their business and like blackmail the mayor and stuff. Um, but the, the point of that is kind of just that like these, these no name, nobody positions in your County, you know, the guys in McMinn County, when they want to fix things, do they run a guy for president? No, they try and get elected sheriff. That, I think, is kind of the level at which people are, are, are you know, dealing with. And I, I think that these kinds of things, like, they're not sexy. They don't offer big wins. They're not, you know, they it's not as exciting. But I think that we're really seeing throughout the Trump administration the limits of what a president can actually do when the entirety of the civil service is, you know, doing everything they can to impede the agenda he was elected to enact. So, yeah, I think it's lightning in a bottle, but I think that there are lessons that can be drawn from it. And I think that the main one is like, you know, get involved in your community. Don't be a, a rootless corporate bug person and, Go to go to go to church and get involved in your, you know, wards, political party. I mean, like, you know, th th literally like you could be ward captain of your political party tomorrow uh, of, of your local political party. If you're choosing like tomorrow, probably I mean, unless you live in like Chicago or some big city. But like, you know, if you live in McMinn County, Tennessee, there's a really good chance that they're just dying for somebody like you to show up and do the grunt work that nobody else wants to do. And it may not even, you know, it may, it may not pay off in 20 years, but it will pay off. The other thing, and excuse me if this sounds conspiratorial, but I'm curious, has the government ever been more apprehensive about training citizens to be able to, do uh, seditious acts like this? Are, are they concerned about veterans having the know-how to actually affect the change? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of think they must because they're not totally stupid and incompetent. So they must have some awareness of like, you know, a bunch of combat trained men with weapons are not easy to push around. But I think that like the difference is, you know, we don't live in a country with a, a draft anymore. We don't have universal conscription, which we had even during peacetime in America. Some of the happiest years of Elvis Presley's life were when he was like running around Germany playing with tanks. And I think that that makes a significant difference because a big part of like what these guys have isn't just that they're from the same part of McMinn County. It's that they, they have, you know, the shared experience of war. And I think that there's, you know, the shared experience of hardship, whether it just simply be, you know, going through basic training and babysitting artillery in South Korea. I think that something is lost when we're not forging that kind of identity. I mean, I, I also am like mostly in favor of conscription for a variety of reasons, but that's one of them and like the only whenever somebody says that they're like against the draft i just assume that they're afraid of doing push-ups but yeah I, like you know whatever like this is this is all chicken hog stuff because like i didn't serve so take it with a gigantic heaping grain of salt but um 
I think that something is lost when we don't have that unifying experience. There is no unifying experience anymore. You know, some people go to college, some people go to the military, some people go to work. The unifying college experience of like nonstop alcohol and drug abuse, I don't think is is really a positive one. I think that it just further atomizes people. And and then the others are not really like the military is a common experience. And but it's it's limited to, you know, in what percentage of Americans have served in the military. I wanna know. I'm looking this up as we speak. There are around twenty million US veterans as of two thousand sixteen, according to the Department of Veteran Affairs. That's less than ten percent of the United States adult population. You compare to, you know, nineteen sixty, and it's like if you ain't a farmer or you ain't a priest or you ain't working in a defense plant, you're going in the army for three years or two years or whatever it was. I think you got two years of you. I think, two, I think if you voluntarily enlisted, you got two years. And if they had to come get you, it was three. But I could be wrong about that. Um, and you had more control over what you were going to do if you enlisted too, which, you know, was par- like part of what uh, made men enlist during that time period. A lot of these guys, like, you know, a lot of these guys remained active in the reserves for decades after the war. You, know, you just were like, okay, well, I'm not in the army anymore, but I still go drill, you know, uh, however f- frequently they do it, you know, or you just would go, you go join the guard until you were 40. It's like, cause partly out of a sense of duty, but I think partly out of a sense that like, you know, like a, like a volunteer firefighter department, it's just, you know, it's just one of the well, a thing men used to do. It's like, I like the military. I'm going to go join the guard so that I can, you know, do that on, I could play weekend warrior a couple weekends a year. Cause I, cause I miss that experience. Uh, James Stewart was like, James Stewart spent tons of time in the guard. It was the guard of the reserve. I don't remember which, but anyway, like, yeah, guys would do that. Cause it was like, you got to kind of, maintain that experience. And I think that, you know, wrapping it up, every president from 1953 to 1993 was a World War II veteran. We haven't had a, well, George Bush, I guess, was like a quote unquote veteran, but uh, no, George Bush was not a, you know, George W. Bush was not a, was not a veteran. He was a draft dodger. And wasn't Jimmy Carter on a nuclear submarine in the Arctic Circle? No, I said until 1953 to 1993. So all, of, I mean, yeah, Eisenhower was a vet. Kennedy was a vet. Johnson was a vet. Nixon was a vet. Car- Carter famously rolled his feet over uh, Coke cans to get his arches high enough that he could join because he got rejected for having flat feet. Yes, yes. And why not the best? Reagan, I think Reagan just made like movies. <laughs> I think Reagan just made like movies and stuff. But whatever, uh, I could be wrong well, about that. Bedtime for Bonzo was critical to the national. Have resolve. you seen Bedtime for Bonzo? Not since I was peeing my pants. Yeah, I was like ten years old, and it was on AMC one day, and I was like, "Oh man, I've never seen a Ronald Reagan movie before." And I love a good chimp comedy, so I'm gonna park out. I think I saw Pride of the Irish and was alarmed to find out he was in it for like three seconds. Really? Yeah, the whole win one for the Gipper yeah. thing. They introduce his character. He almost immediately dies. It's bizarre how he was famous for that. I um, I actually I have a a, a, a bedtime for Bonzo movie poster uh, in in my room in my in my like <laughs> so you're a huge my fan. office. I just, you know, I like, I like, um, chimps. I like, uh, apes really of any variety. And, um, I love that. Like I have, I have very mixed feelings about Ronald Reagan as a president, but, um, I, I think that you hear like, Oh, Ronald Reagan, he was, he was an actor before he was, you know, president. And you think that he was like, Tom Cruise or something. It's like, no, he was like Gary Busey. He was this like (laughs) shitty B movie actor who made stuff like bedtime for Bonzo. 
Um, his version of the killers with Lee Marvin is really good. Um, but that, I think that was like the last thing he ever did. And then he's, you know, started his, uh, his political career, but like, yeah, Ronald Reagan was not a box office draw. He was very much a B list actor. And, you know, so like I've got a, got an original of one of his Chesterfield ads and stuff like that. Cause I just, I find that really fascinating particularly as you know we have a reality game show host president now but anyway we we should wrap this up um i'm gonna wrap it up by as always reminding you that you can get twenty dollars off two hundred dollars worth of ammunition at ammo.com forward slash podcast we got bulk ammo we got like whatever your favorite brand is uh we've got basically every caliber under the sun, like whatever weird thing you use, we probably have. Uh, but if you use, you know, something more common, like a 22 long or a 223 or a nine millimeter, 10 millimeter, um, that, you know, we've definitely got all of that. So come on down to ammo.com forward slash podcast, uh, $20 off any order of $200 or more. And this is Sam Jacobs for Dave Trillo. Thanking you for joining us on the Resistance Library podcast. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.